Good afternoon and welcome all um, on site and online to this panel discussion on banking supervision and the role of banks in the future banking system opportunities and challenges ahead. I'm a moderator and I'm a journalist uh, of the Italian newspaper Sole 24 Ore. And in the next hour, this exceptional panel will bring together forward-looking insights from supervision, central banking, regulation, academia, and markets. Then we will have the last 30 minutes that will give you a chance to ask questions. So I know you know them, but allow me to introduce the panelists. Thornton Beck is Director of the Florence School of Banking and Finance, Professor of Financial Stability at the European University Institute, and is a consultant for, among others, the ECB, the Bank of England, the BIS, the IMF, the Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, and European Commission. Then we have Stein classes, Head of Financial Stability Policy and Deputy Head of the Monetary and Economic Department at the BIS. He represents the BIS externally, the Financial Stability Board, Basel Committee G20. And he held positions in the World Bank, IMF, and he was Senior Advisor uh, at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, Michaela Markusen is uh, Societe Generale Group Chief Economist and leads a team of about 30 economists and sector engineers in a role as head of economic and sector research in the risk division. She has over 30 years of experience in the financial industry. And believe me, I heard it already when you ask questions. <laughs> and we have online, hello, Elizabeth Macau that you know, a member of the supervisory board uh, of the ECB, and she focuses uh -huh. on prudential implications of financial stability, climate change, fintech, and anti-money laundering. So as a journalist, I'm based in Frankfurt, and uh, I write about ECB, uh, monetary policy, and uh, uh, fin um, financial banking supervision. And uh, I must say, as a journalist, I can confirm that we are living in exceptional times. And this, I see it by my articles, also my recent articles, where this word unprecedented always comes up. So, for example, yesterday, and I wrote the article on Andrea and Ria's uh, conversation, he said that there was an unprecedented speed uh, of uh, outflows of deposits. So, never before this speed for this size. And tomorrow, uh, you're going to see what step the ECB makes in its fastest and steepest interest rate increase in the history of the euro. And there again, I wrote this in my article, some unprecedented. And when I spoke with an ECB economist about inflation, he told me, this is unprecedented. I haven't seen inflation going so, up, so fast in so short time. Then also recently, I wrote an article about a discussion paper by the ECB and EOPA on climate insurance protection gap. And there again, I saw that we are unprecedented times for natural catastrophes losses. And there were numbers that were really striking. We are well above the last 10 years average, and this is going to triple in, uh, in, the, in the century. So there again. Of course, the unprecedented war in Ukraine, and I read the report that maybe banks should look at unprecedented geopolitical risk and start to move on China. So there is a lot, and all this brought me also to my last, one of my last articles that I want to tell you about. It was about the results of uh, Deutsche Bank, the first quarter results. And I followed the press conference uh, from the CEO, uh, Christian Seving, and also the uh, call with the analysts. And then at the end of a two hours, more or less, call with analysts, there was a JP Morgan analyst who asked, but uh, to the CEO, um, I see there is this disconnect. Also, the word disconnect was previously. There is disconnect between your share price and your results. And what can you do about it? And 
saving, who is, I think, very straightforward, said, you know what, I asked myself this, and now I ask you, <laughs> analysts of all the banks that who are looking at us, what can we do about it? So today, let's hear what we can do, banks, regulators, supervisors, and uh, my first question will go to Thorsten. Uh, banks are solid, more profitable, but as we have heard, are under pressure by markets and supervisors, regulators on business models, risk management, governance, cybersecurity, money laundering, twin digital and green transition, geopolitical risks. Then we had COVID, financial turmoil, 81, fintech, crypto assets. So, uh, simple question, how do you see the future of banks and the bank of the future? Uh, well, thank you very much. That's a, that's a big question. And I guess the, the one thing I, one word I shouldn't use during the next uh, few minutes is the word unprecedented, I guess. Um, well, I'm not sure what to say about the, the current banking situation, because I think we've heard a lot already yesterday about this. Um, I mean, the one thing uh, that seems to come through is that um, as a system, European banks are in a somewhat stronger position than the uh, than the U.S. banks, um, which again can have many different reasons. Uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, here in Europe, uh, almost all banks are subject to Basel III, unlike in the in the U.S., where some of them actually were taken out um, uh, in five years ago. Which of course and also points to the uh, much more high frequency regulatory cycle that we see in the U.S., where only ten years after the global financial crisis, they started easing uh, regulation, uh, which is not the case here in, in Europe, at least not currently. And of course, with the caveat that actually um, uh, that Andrea mentioned yesterday with uh, respect to the last Basel III uh, package. And one, maybe one can argue that, um, I mean, um, I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm sitting in this building or because they, they pay my, my, my travel costs, but I think the SSM has been doing a quite good job in terms of also supervision. Because it's not just about regulation, it is about supervision. And I think one, uh, and we've had the experience, of course, here in, in Europe, uh, uh, in this country with banks that don't have a proper viable um, business model, which were the Landesbank. And I guess we see something similar now um, um, uh, in the US with uh, some of these uh, regional banks. Now, does that mean we are out of the woods and everything is going fine? Well, maybe not. I mean, we also, uh, the, Euro, the Euro area has seen much less of an increase in interest rates than the, than the US, for example. So maybe there's still something to be ahead. Um, but I think more generally, um, I mean, we're living in, uh, in, in times of very high volatility. Uh, one of the buzzwords now is uh, a poly crisis. Um, um, so multiple shocks coming from different sides. I mean, we had the pandemic, um, but then we had, of course, the energy price uh, hike, even starting before um, the, the invasion, uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we have the more general uh, geopolitical um, uh, tensions. And all of this, of course, makes for um, a lot of different shocks, which uh, still might affect um, banks, the banking system as such, or different banks to a different extent. So I, I would be very cautious uh, about that. Um, I think also um, these repeated kind of shocks that we've seen kind of shifts also the balance, and that's more a more general comment in terms of economic policy, but also specifically in the financial sector, between the role of purely market based allocation processes and the government, the role of the government. Um, I mean, the, 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 the bankers were very happy in, in spring 2020 because for, for, for a change, they were not um, the culprits for the, for the crisis. Um, and actually, they have been helpful as a transmission channel of government, uh, uh, government support um, uh, in guarantees, lending programs, and so on. Um, but of course, as necessary as this was, and I'm not doubting this for one moment, um, with, uh, repeated continuous um, uh, role of governments in supporting the economy is stepping in as a insurer of last resort, of course, reduces to a certain extent the, um, uh, the allocation function of the financial system. So I think that's something to also discuss uh, uh, going forward, uh, both in terms of the role of the financial system, but also in terms of stability risks. Now, um, more broadly, you mentioned the double transition, um, digital and green. I mean, I have the impression that digital, and actually uh, Stein also knows probably much more about this because he has the data. Um, from digitalization, I think Europe is a bit behind. I mean, I think we've seen a much bigger role of fintech and big tech in the US. And I think there is actually still more to come unless the regulator cut it off. Um, 
And um, uh, we've seen it, um, and of course it also means a little bit like also what, uh, what Andrea mentioned yesterday, I mean, Europe still seems overbanked and there might be some of the banks might have to, to exit, something I'm going to come back uh, in, a, in a moment. Then on the green transition, I mean, we've heard just before lunch um, uh, from Mary Sunta that um, banks might be a bit reluctant um, to actually really help with the uh, green transition, if I understood the paper correctly. There's also other work, for example, my former colleague uh, Hans de Reise, um, which basically shows that there is the banks don't really have the incentive to let go of their brown borrowers. Yes, they might support them in a green transition, but they also kind of um, might be reluctant to kind of um, support uh, startups, kind of new um, 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 uh, cont contestants, um, challengers uh, in the respective sectors that kind of introduce new uh, technological uh, green innovation or, or technologies because of the legacy assets to kind of protect these uh, these uh, these positions. Um, so there's, uh, that's one. And the other one, the other point is there, and I think there has been also a paper um, um, by um, Luke Lavin, I think it's by Alex Popov, I'm not quite sure, but uh, there's of course also risk shifting. You, you squeeze the banks on one side by then telling them you can't um, do more, um, you have to become greener in your home country and then they shift the bad stuff um, abroad, preferably to uh, the, uh, emerging countries. So that's, um, that's another issue that has to be uh, kind of also taken into account. So yes, I think there is a lot of pressure um, still to come uh, from uh, digitalization green transition. Uh, which I think again, and I brought this up actually in a question yesterday to Andrea, um, that we really need a robust bank resolution framework in Europe, which I think there has been lots of progress made, I'm, I don't denying it at all, but I think, um, and there's, there are more proposals on the table, but they're kind of very little steps, kind of baby steps, and I think we need uh, much more on that. Um, ideally, we would actually also get to the point, and uh, um, uh, here, for those who know me, um, uh, I'm sounding like a, a broken record. We need more cross-border mergers between big banks um, uh, in uh, in Europe. So we have to go away from this idea of uh, Deutsche Bank being German, Société Générale being French, Unicredit being Italian, but having really um, uh, European banks. So maybe very last point, um, the European bank of the future, the bank of the future, um, I don't think there's one type. Um, I have this feeling that there will be more like large banks, and I also hope for that, large cross-border banks in Europe, and then more the local banks. But I see that with them in the middle being squeezed more by the competitive pressure. But then again, I might be might be wrong on that, but that's kind of one way I, uh, I see the structure mo um, developing for going forward. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. Um, yes, you, you do uh, mention the various types of banks that we have in Europe. You mentioned also the, the regional, and uh, this is also one of the strengths of, uh, of, the, of the European system with our SMEs that have to be reached also by smaller banks. So this is, comes into the equation. And so my question to um, Stein, um, banks so are facing um, multiple crises, as we hear, but I think also regulators are facing this crisis. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, we have to deliver on basics that banks have to finance the economy, households and corporates, and they have to be solid and profitable. So what can you tell us about the regulatory framework in these challenging times? Uh, thanks, Isabel, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to be a little bit uh, uh, covering the same issues that Thorsten did in terms of setting the stage. Uh, first of all, I, I think we should think of the system as being relatively robust in the, in, in the presence of these large shocks, and, and you mentioned them already. Uh, uh, we've had uh, much higher interest rates uh, after the COVID shock uh, and the war shock, so, and banks have done well. So yes, we see some weaknesses here and there, and, and they're not completely idiosyncratic, but there's a big idiosyncratic uh, element to it uh, in those US cases, but also in the European cases. Uh, so, but on the whole, um, losses are not large yet, NPLs are not large, so, uh, and banks have these uh, stock uh, good positions in terms of both capital li and liquidity. So I think we, we should be proud in some sense of what we achieved in the reform since the GFC. Uh, that took quite an effort, uh, but not all the way there yet. So we should uh, keep the, the pressure up to finish Basel III and other reforms. Uh, but we, the starting point is nevertheless a, a good one. Um, now having said that, there's always the half full, half empty class. You're right, there are regulatory issues that we um, have 
not necessarily ignored. I mean, they were on the table in the Basel Committee in earlier days, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes it's getting a consensus around the table on some of those issues. Um, I mentioned some of them, but I think they're very obvious that we're studying at the moment and that we will come out in the future as to what it is that we may want to do. Um, we should keep in mind that Basel three is, is meant to be a hard stop, so we're not going to open up the whole thing very quickly and very soon. But there are issues about the, the treatment of unrealized losses. Uh, we're going to obviously be talking about interest rate risk. We're going to talk about uh, liquidity coverage ratios and the design of the particular parameters there, the not net stable funding. AT1 is an issue, not just on the micro potential, but also the market for the AT1s uh, is, is clearly there. Um, and more generally, proportionality and how you balance that. Uh, the countries have different views on that. Uh, you know Europe is, is one, uh, but that's not uh, necessarily the model around the world where you have one regulation applying to all the sets of banks. So, so I think we're going to be talking about that, but again, don't hold your breath for it. <laughs> it will take some time to get uh, the new rules uh, thought through properly. Um, but I, I, in some sense, also want to say don't hold your breath for it because that's, I don't think it's necessarily going to be the solution. Um, because these micro prudential rules, as we have designed them in Basel III, did achieve quite a bit, uh, particularly on the capital side, I would say. But there's also things that don't necessarily add up to the uh, system-wide level, right? Uh, particularly when you talk about liquidity, um, that's something that you can achieve at individual bank level at a certain way, a liquidity covers ratio. But it doesn't mean that the system as a whole is more uh, safe. So we need to think both micro prudential and we need also think macro prudential um, and how we achieve that. And there I, I, I com completely agree with, um, with Thorsten, the role of supervisors is key. Um, so uh, the supervisors have to be micro prudential oriented, of course, but they also have, a, have to have a systemic overlay. Uh, and there the tools in principle are there, but we don't necessarily always use them. Uh, it doesn't always have to be pillar one, it can be pillar two that you can bring to, to bear on this. Um, so that in terms of big picture, kind of setting the stage of where we are, um, to, to uh, address some of your specific issues uh, as regards the European banking system, um, you mentioned uh, issues about fragmentation, and Thorsten also alluded about that. Um, well, first of all, regulation in principle is meant to reduce fragmentation, right? So to the extent we have, have a level playing field, uh, both within uh, the European countries, but even more important globally, um, and that comes along with consistent implementation, we would have less fragmentation in principle. Um, now, we haven't seen it in practice, and this is where the banking union, of course, is a, a key component for the European sense, uh, besides the SSM. We need to complete all the pillars of that in order to uh, allow for that. Um, is that enough? I don't think so, because, and again, Thorsten alluded to it, we haven't seen the, the cross-border banking, the M&As, working uh, to a significant degree. Um, we have crises in countries, but the solution is always a national one. Um, so we, we really have to, to move towards uh, more of a cross-border practice and then really get the system also more competitive. Um, now, when I think of, of the, the bank-specific issues, um, I think that's always down to the business model. Um, and I think there are, unfortunately, uh, besides maybe those savings and loans, Londres, uh, Sparkasse, there are other banks that have questions about the business model, and it shows up in the price to book ratio. Um, uh, and here, um, it's not so easy to, to give the solution. So the, I'm not a JP Morgan analyst, I have that can, uh, on, on the basis. But I think the digitalization uh, is a key component where the European banks are quite quite far behind. Uh, so um, getting the greater benefit of that and then being able to stand up to the competition, it's fintechs. Big techs have so far been outside, uh, luckily in some sense, of financial service provision. Um, but we at the BS have been writing about this for a number of years. And um, in some sense, we were expecting it, but it, uh, it didn't happen when we had things like Libra and Diem come along that were st uh, stopped in the end. Uh, but if they were to go down that route, uh, it's not obvious to me that most of the banks can, can compete in, in the payment space uh, and maybe even in the credit space with those big techs. Uh, so there's a big uh, issue here. Um, 
but also some some basic issues of of, of cost to income ratios that digitalization would really help uh, i mean there are many european banks that even at some point went above 100 percent on the cost to income ratio and that's not a good uh, model of course to to work with um, so making banks more profitable goes back to this level playing field to some extent uh, but is also forcing a little bit more from the uh, from the um, uh, supervisory side um, i can talk about green but maybe let me save that for the next round and then we can discuss that in more detail uh, thank you stein um of what you said um it's uh, that the banks are doing well and robust uh i must say that uh, with this liquidity issue and uh, what happened not only in the us but with the uh, credit suisse i must say that um, banks are, are under so much pressure because of the risk of contagion of on deposits. And when analysts ask banks about the deposits, well, banks can really say a lot about the liquidity and liquidity buffers. And this buffer above the, the threshold of the liquidity requirement has been so helpful uh, in this crisis not to get contagion. All banks could say, or many banks could say, we have this on the top of what was required. We have so much liquidity. And this really, in a contagion situation that where contagion is, again, another fast mover, I think this helped a lot. So liquidity was, uh, yes, when you said we can be proud of what we did. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, so uh, my question to Michaela, um, because banks have, are being asked to do so much, and to deal with uh, all, uh, not only crisis, but uh, challenges and uh, uh, a lot of investments also. Um, the uh, European Union uh, uh, has been working on, uh, for years now, I've been reporting for ages about the capital markets and capital markets union. But if we think about the instruments, the tools that bank should have, maybe you can also tell us about this. Thank you. So thank you very much, and, and thank you for inviting me here today. I, I think I'll, so I agree with, uh, I would say, 95% of what's been said so far um, on the bank. So, but I, I just wanted to, to step back and, uh, and really think a little bit about how things have changed uh, over the past decade or so. So, of course, we've had, since the great financial crisis, tremendous change in regulation and supervision uh, in Europe. We have made improvements on our architecture, but I think we can all agree that there are still some pretty big pieces missing in this architecture. We've also had this period of very low for long, and we've had tremendous expansion of the central bank balance sheets. So I, I think this is something really important, because what does it mean? It means um, well, that operationally, uh, the interbank market has basically disappeared. And we've moved from a corridor system to a floor system. Now, of course, one of the big topics this year, it's, it's not our topic today, but I think it's very important, is the discussion in the ECB on, on how this new operational framework is going to be in the future. And it's uh, important for the banks, but I would also say it's going to be super important for the governments. So um, it's not our topic, but I think it's very important. You, you mentioned unprecedented, and, and we always hear a, a second word along with the unprecedented, which is unprecedented uncertainty. And I just wanted to say a, a word about this, because there's a very nice chart from globalpolicyuncertainty.com. You can look at the global policy uncertainty, and we see something quite interesting. You have the whole decade sort of, uh, it starts around the mid-1990s, late 1990s. And then up to the great financial crisis, we had some really nasty things happening, Asia crisis, Russia crisis, many crises. But every time after a crisis, we came back to a very low base of uncertainty. Then we had the great financial crisis, then we had the euro crisis, we started going up. Then there was a short period where we thought, hey, maybe we're going to go back to the low base again. But no, Brexit, uh, debt ceilings, war, COVID, many things happening. And so what we've seen is that we've really had this structural, ongoing structural increasing trend of uncertainty. And, and I think, you know, this raises some, some very big questions. 
And what we've seen is that the fragmentation that we often talk about in Europe is also very present at the global level. Um, we see this. We see that the question of extraterritoriality is one that enters in greatly as well. And we see now that uh, people have become uh, much more focused as well on what does it mean if I'm operating in a country with uh, potential geopolitical tensions looming ahead. So this also changes the way that both uh, non-financial companies and, and banks are, and financial companies are looking to do business. I would also add that we also see a, a societal fragmentation, and I think this is something that we, we cannot overlook. And then, of course, we have these accelerated transitions. So we mentioned digital and green, but we also see it in terms of uh, how companies think about their supply chains. You know, previously, everything was just in time. Now, everything is becoming just in case. Uh, just in case what? Well, we can discuss about this. And then I would say that to this uh, unprecedented uncertainty, I'm going to add unusual, because <laughs> when I look at the economy today, so my role is to be an economist, it's really hard to forecast, right? Because I'm dealing with all these unusual buffers, these huge volumes of excess savings that built up during the pandemic. How quickly, how are they unwinding? How are they distributed? Big question. Unusual corporate profits unusually low corporate defaults, bankruptcies, and unusually low unemployment. I mean, if you look at the chart on the bankruptcy rate, and then you look at the chart on the unemployment rate, you get a little bit of a hint as to why we've had such an exceptionally low unemployment rate, but it's not the only reason. So with all of these uh, factors in mind, of course, uh, business models, even before the pandemic and the war uh, for banks had to adapt. And this adaptation basically uh, entails several shifts. It entails a shift from interest rate generating business to fee generating business. It changes shifts in funding structures. And uh, then it also changes a shift in risks. And this shift in risks, we've also seen it between the banks and the non-banks with a lot of the risks that were, are carrying leverage and illiquidity shifting outside the banking system. And I think this is very important to, to keep in mind. So question is, how will these models adapt? And I think the bigger question is, what are they supposed to adapt to? So some things we can know quite well. We need to do something about financing the accelerated transitions. But exactly how are we supposed to adapt to all of this new uncertainty? It's very hard to know. And the only way to do this really is to adopt uh, this just-in-case approach and you both mentioned, the, we heard it earlier today, the role of governments in how much of the just-in-case risk should the government takes on. And then I think the really interesting one is the higher interest rate risk. So the big debate now, you've, many of you will have seen it, is where is our star and where is our star going to? Are we going to go back lower? Are we going to go higher? It's a very big debate. There was a nice debate with Blanchard and, uh, and Summers. Um, and even on inflation, are, is inflation going to go higher? We hear a lot about greenflation, fossilflation, climateflation, but digitalization is probably deflationary. So we're not really quite sure what environment we are in. So there is one thing, however, that we're quite sure of, it seems. And that is that, and it's a bit sad, really, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. I meet very few people who disagree. And uh, if there's anyone in the room, you know, if you don't want to tell us in public, come and see me in break. I would really like to, to talk to you. Who disagree that we need the banking union and the capital markets union. Unfortunately, I meet even fewer people who think it's going to happen anytime soon. And that means that we really have to raise some, some big questions about how we can move forward uh, in, in, in financing in Europe. And I think for, for that, we can take some, some reflection on the risk sharing. So, of course, the, the first channel of risk sharing that we often think about is public risk sharing. And this is also probably the biggest impediment to us in Europe today, is our difficulty to accept public risk sharing across borders. Then we have the capital markets channel, which is about holding diversified portfolios across jurisdictions. And then we have the credit channel, which is about lending across jurisdictions. 
Before we get too excited, I just want to remind us all that uh, what happened with the European debt crisis was basically that the credit channel pulled back very quickly. And there's some very nice papers on this, uh, which look at how these credit channels and capital markets channels work in terms of risk sharing. And what we observe from the US, and I think this is a very important lesson to us, is that these two so-called private channels of risk sharing in the US, capital and credit, actually come with tremendous public support. We see this public support through the mortgages with the government-sponsored enterprises. We see it, Isabel, you, you, Isabella, you mentioned uh, the SMEs in the US, the Small Business Administration plays a huge role and acts as a fiscal tool as well in the times of crisis. And of course, uh, we also see that there has been, uh, again, tremendous support um, um, from, from various temporary measures, which we've seen in Europe as well. But I think these more permanent features of public risk sharing are, are hugely important. And I would say that if we are looking at the capital markets union as a kind of the, the lowest political hurdle thing we can advance on now, and we believe that we can do everything through private risk sharing, we, we may very soon find ourselves in a kind of Euro crisis too, because this is exactly the belief that we had when we created the euro in the first place, that we could have the private risk sharing across the borders, and then this would give us the, the optimal monetary union. So I think we have to be uh, extremely uh, careful in thinking about this, this risk sharing. And then the final point, I, I two final points I wanted to make. A first point, which I think is very important for Europe to think about, is our sovereignty. Um, and it's been a discussion, we had the discussion on the internationalization in the euro, but I think sovereignty is becoming even more important. And I think the financial system is a big part of sovereignty. And then we talk very often about the idea of a level playing field, and I think it is hugely important. And unfortunately, I think we've seen with the latest developments in the US that the playing field was not quite as level as we wanted it to be, because it's not just about having a level playing field in regulation, it's also about a level playing field in supervision. And uh, I, I, I would go so far as to say that that was not the case. And that, I think, is very important when we start to think about climate change. And we can pick up it in the next round. But I would just make one point. We all agree that we need a carbon border adjustment mechanism so that uh, Chinese companies cannot produce uh, goods in China which have high emissions and sell them into Europe or in the US or anywhere else. It doesn't have to be from China. In fact, in some ways, maybe China is not doing that badly on thinking about going green, but that's another discussion. Um, but my question is, do we have to think about something similar in finance? Do we need a carbon border adjustment mechanism for finance as well? And so I think these are some of the things that we need to, to think about as we move ahead. And my final point is that cost efficiency is hugely important because we do need to have profitable banks. For banks to be profitable, they need to be cost efficient as well. And here, I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of just taking a step back and, and not necessarily lightening, reg, uh, not taking away regulation, not taking away supervision, but thinking about, is there something we can do to make it more efficient, uh, to make it more optimal? And uh, I would make a suggestion if we could have a central climate data platform, that would be top. We would save a lot of money and we would keep money inside of Europe as well. Thank <laughs> Sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Um, for um, your thoughts and also the propositions and the, the ideas that you have to look forward. Um, I, I, I must say that um, in all of your interventions, there is uh, this uh, um, quest for more Europe. Uh, we are doing a lot, but uh, the, my feeling is that we, have, we should do more. Um, if it is banking union or capital market union or the state or so it's um, we'll, we'll have the chance on the second round but now Elizabeth um, 
yes, we can see you and uh, you can see us. <laughs> so um, my question to you, um, what are the lessons learned from uh, the recent multiple, as we heard, the crisis cases from a supervisory perspective? And uh, also, which are now your priorities as so much is going on at the same time? So looking ahead, what is the priorities from a supervisory point of view? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. I wish I were there in person. Um, I very much agree with my fellow panelists on a wide variety of the subjects that have been addressed. And uh, let me highlight one in particular. And that is, I think all of you have very much to be, have a lot to be proud of um, in, in making more Europe over the last uh, decade because it's really been something that has um, helped us tremendously in these unusual, unprecedented polycrisis times that we find ourselves in. It's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite important that there was such a, a focus on strengthening the soundness of the financial institutions that operate across Europe. And that has really helped us through the pandemic, through the supply chain shocks, through the war, through the inflationary uh, period that we're living through now, and through uh, uh, this, this banking crisis that we see happening internationally. Um, and I'd like to just spend a moment, uh, a couple of moments on that. You, you may, all of you know that um, our chair of the SSM, Andre Enria, asked almost a year ago uh, for a, a report. Um, and, and really it's a, it's a brave thing to do to have uh, outside experts uh, come in and have a look at how we do our supervision. How are we effective? Are we efficient? Um, what do we need to do to continue to improve ourselves? And uh, we asked a group of former supervisors, uh, persons with international experience and uh, each a, a person with a great deal of gravitas and expertise in the area. And we gave an open book to them uh, over the last eight months for them to review our processes, review the effectiveness of our supervision. And we released a report uh, just a couple of weeks ago. The timing could not have been better to be looking at the effectiveness of supervision. The eyes of the world have turned to uh, the effectiveness of supervision in the wake of the issues in the US with SVB signature, now First Republic, Silver Lake, um, and then also, of course, with respect to Credit Suisse. And, and the questions that are being asked are about, um, you know, what needs to be strengthened? Uh, do we have the right regulatory framework? Uh, what is, is supervision effective? Um, so I'm, I'm really very proud of the fact that um, we're not asking those questions for the first time now. We are coming to this conversation with a tremendous amount of work done, albeit the questions weren't being asked in the context of, um, of the banking crisis that we see in these days. But interestingly, and, and you also know that the, uh, the US supervisors, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve released a, a report uh, also last week. Um, they promised to do that review on, in the wake of the Signature Bank and um, SVB Bank uh, issues in particular. And uh, they released their own report about you know, what happened in, in the context of the effectiveness of supervision. And very interestingly, there's some uh, similarities in the recommendations that um, were made both in the US and by the wise persons that uh, looked at uh, the ECB's processes in the SSM. Um, and so the similarities are these. First, um, you know, supervisors need to be developing a more robust understanding of the risks that banks face and how those are evolving with economic, financial, and, and the technological environment. 42 billion going out the door um, in, in five hours uh, on the strength of social media um, tweets is, is really something unprecedented to use that word. So we, we need to really be uh, upping our game across 
both sides of the Atlantic with respect to our understanding of the changing, changing environment. Second is to really focus in on the culture of supervision and shift it toward a greater focus on, on inherent risk in the banking system and to encourage um, uh, more conviction, more willingness to form judgments that challenge bankers with a precautionary perspective. And then third, uh, to strengthen the escalation process inside uh, the supervisory system so that there is a systematic um, elevated focus on long dated material issues that remain unremediated to move those toward a much more rapid remediation process. But having focused on some of the similarities in the conclusions and recommendations in the two reports, um, uh, I think it's important to also highlight there's very significant differences. There is uh, not a, read, a, a direct read across of the U.S. events to the euro area for, for the significant banks. And, um, you know, there's some reasons why that's the case. First, the banks that we supervise in Europe don't have these outlier features that you see in these regional banks that, um, uh, that, that, were, that failed in the United States. Um, we don't have the same extreme interest rate risk, and we don't have the business model where there's a major reliance on concentrated uninsured deposit base and the correlation between, uh, you know, a very a particular type of business model and uh, lending, uh, lending base uh, correlated to the deposit base. Second, um, unlike in the U.S., and maybe this goes to Michaela's level playing field point, all of the banks are subject to liquidity standards that are established by the Basel Committee in Europe, and that includes the LCR and the NSFR. And more than half of the existing buffers of highly liquid assets are made up of cash and central bank reserves, which mitigates the risk of mark-to-market losses when liquidity needs arise. And we are not exempting banks from deducting unrealized losses on available for sale securities from their capital. So, um, you know, there's, a, I think also um, Stein alluded to this, we need to be asking questions about LCR, um, available for sale, um, held to maturity portfolios, capital calculations, and make sure in light of the current um, market environment that we're in, that we have got it right from a regulatory point of view. But I think, uh, you know, we have good reasons to be um, encouraged by the strength of the banking sector in Europe. Um, we also, and I, I, I would be very much failing if I didn't say this, we're also very much adopting this um, stance of, of looking to be agile um, and looking to have courage of our convictions in this very, very uncertain and unusual period of time. The markets are um, quite unpredictable and it's we need to be at the top of our game. And I think agility is, is a key part of that. I'll turn to the second part of your question now about um, the priorities. And in a polycrisis environment, you know, there's uh, um, so many priorities that you need to have. I was turning to the second part of your question, Isabella, um, which was about our priorities. And I'll just touch on uh, on a few that I think are very important. And my colleagues on the panel have also um, focused in on, on some of these priorities uh, with very good reason. The first one is interest rate risk and liquidity. Um, and you know the rise in, in interest rates is certainly one of the key drivers of the market stress that we've observed in recent months. Um, but we've also seen that the rising rates have, have supported, and on an overall basis, been supporting the euro area banks lending margins. And on balance at the moment, it's a positive for the banks. We're seeing profitability and, and we're not seeing uh, that the rising interest rates are, are negative. So, Deposit rates have increased so far more slowly than the asset yields, and that's boosted aggregate net interest income in the euro area by about 15% during 2022. We're looking very carefully at sectors where the interest rate hikes can create an issue. We're going to continue doing that. Um, uh, we started that last year. We'll continue doing that um, in 2023. We have um, already performed targeted offsite review and on-site inspections on exposure to interest rate and credit spread risks, and we are continuing to perform those similar activities, and we're paying very close attention to sectors that are exposed to interest rates, such as the commercial and the residential real estate sectors, and we're following up with banks on um, you know, the results of this targeted review, looking 
for potential deficiencies that have been identified and also looking carefully at developments. Are the institutions strengthening their interest rate risk measurement and their management? Uh, because I think we, we and the banks need to be agile in this area. Um, we're, we've also um, conducted work and it is ongoing to address vulnerabilities related to a lack of diversification in funding sources and any deficiencies that we identify in funding plans. And that includes an analysis of the exit strategies for the TLTRO. So we're focused in on that. Second priority for us um, is this area of cyber IT risk and digitalization. Um, and so here um, with cyber risk, I'm very proud of the fact that I think we may be the first supervisor that are launching a cyber risk stress test. Um, we're going to be asking institutions to um, react to scenarios. So we're not talking about um, um, conducting hacking exercises or something like that. We want to make sure that the institutions have operational resiliency in the event that there is a cyber attack uh, that affects operations in some way. And so this has been a priority for us. We've been closely um, monitoring. We didn't see as uh, much uh, cyber activity as we thought we might in the context of the Russian war in the Ukraine, um, but we continue to very much have the concern that um, the current geopolitical situation can give rise to continued um, stress in this area. Um, digitalization, I'll just spend a moment on this. Um, you know, we, we're you know, living in unique times. I'll add a word to our discussion today, and it's really a technological renaissance. Um, there is tremendous opportunity in front of us. We, we saw what happened with um, ChatGPT onboarding 100 million users in January in only two months of having that, uh, that product launched. Uh, how will that, um, the use of AI, have an impact on the operations of institutions? How can digitalization transformation result in more cost effectiveness for institutions. So um, having a digital strategy is, is certainly an imperative for the institutions that we supervise. It also comes with risks. Um, how do we understand what uh, black box analytics may be producing in the AI area? Is there discrimination? Is there bias? Are there incorrect outcomes that are being generated? Um, I think this puts a focus also, one of our priorities on governance uh, we need to have at the top levels of the institutions um, enough understanding of the technological change that's taking place. So uh, very much uh, focused on these priorities. And like my colleagues, I'll just mention climate risk uh, very briefly. That is certainly a priority. And here again, I've been extremely proud to be associated with the ECB because of the focus on climate risk. We started over three years ago with asking institutions to conduct self-assessments. We have done thematic reviews. We're, we have done a climate stress test. Um, these are learning exercises for we as supervisors, also for the institutions. Um, points up uh, you know, tremendous need for focus on transition and uh, deep understanding of what will happen um, uh, as a result of government policies. For us, this is bread and butter climate risk, it's about credit risk and, and physical operational risk. Um, so it's, it's a normal part of our activities to be concerned about these risks. Um, I'm proud of the fact that the focus we've put on this has moved the dialogue in the institutions from uh, you know, social government policy, government relations area of the bank to the CFO office, the risk office, and the board. And I think that was you know, really an essential change that needed to take place. So I will uh, just stop there and apologies that it, it blinked out for a moment there. No, no, it worked uh, very well. So um, we could uh, see you and hear you well all throughout um, only a short break. Um, but thank you for your um, your thoughts. And uh, I must say that it is true that we live in unprecedented uncertainty, but we all look at the supervisor uh, to see that you have certainties in the way that you move and the way that you uh, set your priorities. And I, my impression is that in all the uncertainties, 
uh, you are focusing on the risks also that are coming and uh, to prepare banks also for the unexpected. Now we have a second round before we start the uh, and open the floor for questions. And so I will not ask you uh, a specific question each because uh, so much has been said to comment on, but only one thing from my side, um, I, I would like also if you may uh, have a comment on the fact that we need more m &A uh, in the banking uh, uh, system in Europe. I mean, uh, after all this, uh, to face also the challenges on a global, uh, in a global way with US and China and India, I mean, why aren't we doing more? Uh, uh, there is a lot of ring, ring fencing, I think, maybe too much. So Torrenson, you, you start off. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I have actually five points, and one of them actually refers to, to what you just said. Um, first, actually, the comment you made earlier on liquidity, um, I think liquidity buffers are important, but there's a limit to it. I mean, if your underlying business model doesn't work, and if you have hidden losses, then as much liquidity as you can have, it, it doesn't help. And I think, that, to me, that seems the case in the end. Uh, for SVB. I mean, I don't think this was an irrational bank run. It was a very irrational bank run. People pulled their money out because they kind of could see there are hidden losses and that bank is not going anywhere. So I think there is, um, I think, uh, there, I guess in this case, I would say, and I think the, the report by the Federal Reserve pointed it out, I mean, there was number one, a failure of risk management within the bank, but then second, there was a supervisory uh, mismanagement. And only third is then the ultimately that it wasn't subject to Basel III. So I think that has to be kind of kept in mind. Um, very quick question, um, and I don't have an answer on this, maybe it's a bit provocative. Um, uh, Mikala, you said unprecedented, uncertain, unusual. I wonder, so unusual low unemployment, unusually low um, bankruptcy, is that maybe also artificial a little bit? Is that where the this whole government support still has like an after effect? Um, because I mean, I remember the discussion we've had in 2020 about the expected wave of corporate insolvency of non-performing assets, and they haven't shown up, which we're all very happy about, okay? I'm not, uh, um, I always like to be proved wrong, but um, so I'm just wondering that that's more, more of a question or uh, an open question. Um, I find actually also your point on the carbon adjustment mechanism for cross-border banks, a very interesting point. And I think it refers some, to something I mentioned earlier on this kind of like risk, uh, well, I guess it's not risk shifting, it's dirt shifting basically, right? So you can't uh, um, uh, do a, a brown lending at home, then you do brown lending somewhere else, or you sell it off to somebody. And I think that's gonna be a challenge. Uh, it's somewhat similar to this debate on the regulatory perimeter and on cross-border um, uh, supervisory uh, corporation on um, also what and I wanted to mention this earlier and I forgot what uh, Elizabeth mentioned on these uh, um, and cyber risk for example cyber stress risk so I think that's that also shows that um, going forward for risk management we're working on two fronts and one is to have sufficient buffers I mean you mentioned capital buffer uh, liquidity buffer capital buffer and so on but I think for certain catastrophic risk I mean you there's not enough capital to be held so it is really about about crisis management plans uh, for example, in the case of uh, of cyber risk, or even f well, got there are worse uh, um, geopolitical uh, uh, risks, um, and then finally, on what you mentioned, the um, the cross border. Um, so, and I, also coming back to what uh, Mikala mentioned on sovereignty financial system. So, I think the issue you know, that that's right. I mean, and I think that's also why we still have national banking in the in, in Europe because it is seen as part of uh, sovereignty. And I think again, in this the country where we're sitting right now. Well, we might be exoterritorial, I'm not sure. But so in Germany, um, this, the, the politically uh, kind of induced merger talks between Deutsche and Commerz show that there is too much nationalism in banking. Um, and I think that's that the only way to move away from that is to move to a um, to European financial system and define sovereignty at the European level, not, the, not on the national level. Now, that sounds, I don't know, political scientist talk or sounds very ambitious and I know it's very ambitious and I think there's also a long way to get there um, uh, because it's not just so the banking union itself would be really only a necessary but not a sufficient um, as condition to really get to these cross-border merchants to get to a truly European uh, banking system. So I think more has to happen and I think that's something uh, actually to be the, uh, uh, discussed much further but I think yes ultimately that's going to be uh, the, the challenge to really 
uh, move uh, uh, towards not giving up on the local banks, by the way, not at all. I mean, I think the diversity is something to be celebrated, but to get to really a, um, a, uh, a European financial system, and that there's, there's much more met, much to do. Thanks. Thank you. We must be ambitious, <laughs> I think, looking forward. So, uh, Spain, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, let me also use uh, five points. Uh, so starting with the m and I mean, I agree largely with what Thorsten says. I would add a little bit there. That to the extent the banks are not profitable in general, it's very hard to see m and right? Because then why would you do it in the first place? So we need to make banking a more profitable business, which is cost efficient digitalization. But we also need to rationalize the banking uh, system as a whole in terms of number of banks. And if we're not going to do that, there are these banks. They're not necessarily... The kind of default, but they're of a zombie na and of nature that they distort the overall banking system by keeping maybe margins low, deposit rates, etc. So in that sense, uh, we need to think of it more holistic. Uh, that's partly SSM versus the national supervisors, possibly, where the SSM has the pan-European view, but not necessarily the, the national one. So back to the sovereignty question, but in a little bit of a twisted, a different way. Um, uh, second point, non-banks. Thorsten mentioned it. Uh, we can talk the whole afternoon about non-banks, uh, but uh, to the extent it's a, it's a competitive force for the banks, but we don't think that they are regulated properly and exposed, they get support in the form of bailout. Uh, then we're distorting, of course, the banks implicitly as well. So there's a feedback effect that we should keep in mind. We've done a lot on the non-banks, but we haven't gone there all the way. And we've definitely done le less on the non-banks than we've done on the banks. Uh, uh, it, from a system perspective, we still have this micro-investor protection, consumer protection perspective, but not what does the system as a whole deliver us in terms of overall financial stability. And then the non-banks have been time after time an issue uh, that comes up in, in very discreet ways and then suddenly it's a big number but we have to worry about it every day not only when these things arise um, third point uh, and this is Michaela mentioned uh, risk sharing you know I think uh, Europe we wake up to risk sharing exposed but not ex ante right so we have these uh, mechanisms that we get in there and then we support those that have failed. And this is always, of course, the problem with, with crisis. You end up uh, supporting the failing guy. You really should be supporting the good guy, and you should do that as much as possible before. And so we need to move away from it. Now, what Michaela says, there's a role for the state there. Yes, I agree it, but let's be careful. Let's not overdo it. Uh, but we should support this, this risk sharing in many, many different ways. But let's not get to, to, to the banking union comp completion only when we get a major liquidity run in Europe. I mean, please, uh, let's, let's be a little bit better than we uh, have maybe done in the past. Um, point four, crypto we didn't talk about. Um, something where Europe maybe has a little bit of a lag up uh, in terms of at least putting down a framework. Is it a perfect one? No. Um, but at, at the same time, on the regulatory side, on the crypto, I don't think we should overgo on the regulatory side. I always think of the world, you can you can ban crypto, you can try to contain it, uh, you can try to regulate it, or you can actually put something uh, forward that is even better than what the people think they're getting out of crypto. I don't think they're getting out much out of crypto in the first place, but to the extent they think they're getting something out of it, let's offer them something better. Um, and let's be careful on the regulatory side because you can easily give the signal that it's a good thing um, when we don't necessarily think think socially it is a good thing. So um, that's my point on crypto. Finally, on green, I, was, um, I, I'm a little bit more in the camp. Let's not put the horse before the cart, or wait, wait, behind the cart, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the sense of um, that we need to think of green a little bit more holistically. This is going to have to be driven by the, by the state, setting the right prices on the real side, to regulation, carbon taxes, whatever. Uh, border adjustment mechanisms. Finance will follow them, and it will be so much easier for finance to follow when the real side is giving the right signals, right? Now, if you keep pushing on finance to take the lead, we're going to end up with these things that we heard from Maria Sunta, that we overdoing it and really not over-promising and not really delivering. We're going to have green bubbles. We're going to still have possibly at some point the sector waking up having a brown run in the sense that those things that we really still need, which is energy in part, is not going to be financed anymore. So if unless we have that holistic picture, finance could have a more difficult time and actually even make things worse uh, in my point of view. So be careful where we want to go with green uh, if you don't have that piece of the puzzle in place. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Stein. Um, of uh, your remarks, um, when you said on non-banks issues, uh, I mentioned in the introduction this discussion paper by EOPAN and the ECB on insurance and natural catastrophes. And I, uh, by reading it, I thought it was very interesting how the two points of views of of two um, authorities were put together to reach a common aim coming from different perspectives. So maybe that can also be done more uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, please, Michaela, the floor is yours. So thank you. So I'll, I'll try and pick up on a, on a few of these topics. I think when we, when we think about the, the question of consolidation, and uh, I, you know, I can only agree, um, we do need to see consolidation in the European banking industry, um, perhaps both at the national level and at the cross-border level. One thing that I think is really important to try and think about is what, what are the wins from having a cross-border European bank today? And when you think about the, the differences between banking markets in individual European countries, you know, it's, uh, if you go from one European country to the next, the supermarkets are remarkably similar, right? You find most of the same products. There is the odd little twist, but it's 90% the same. If you go and you look at the type of services, you, the type of products that the banks offer, they're actually hugely different. The way mortgages are done, the way savings products are done, the way pricing is done, uh, do you charge interest on, do you give interest on deposits or not, do you get fees, do you get checks, are they free? Um, and, and part of that has to do with uh, the tradition of the country, but part of it also has to do with the rules that, that have been negotiated and agreed with governments, you know, and, and I think if we, if, we, if we want to build a case for the, for the mergers, especially in retail banking, it's not that easy to, to do today. Uh, so I think this is very important. And then I think there is indeed the, the clear question of ring fencing. And then I think there is the question of the single jurisdiction, but also the sovereignty. Because if a big European bank today, or a small European bank today, gets into difficulties, they know which sovereign to turn to. A big US bank knows which sovereign to turn to. Which sovereign does a big European bank turn to? And does it then become a question of several sovereigns having to agree, which we know is quite difficult. So I, I think it really is, a, it really raises some, some very big questions on the sovereign side. On the transition, I think we've heard it several times today, but you know, it's something that strikes me very often in policy setting, is there is a question of where is the lowest political hurdle in putting in measures, right? So question, is the lowest political hurdle on measures to accelerate the climate transition, is that measures put onto the financial system? If the answer to that question is yes, and we all agree that that's probably not the best place, and we saw some very nice papers this morning, to put the policy, then I think there's something that has to be said very loudly to the governments in terms of the transition policy. And, and I think, uh, you know, we had very nice research illustrating this point this, this morning. Now, on the non-banks, I, I think the, the, the point made, uh, Stein, you made the point, I think, you know, it's hugely important. If we're supposed to bail out non-banks, then yes, they have to be regulated. If we're not supposed to bail them out, then fine, but then they have to take the losses. And, and I think we're very unclear on, on, on this type of arrangement. And then I think there's another dimension that we have to think about, which is also consumer protection on the non-banks. You know, I am very scared when I see people uh, buy into stable coins. Do they realize that they're buying into unsecured bank deposits? Do they really understand this? I'm not sure, you know, but uh, we saw this in the US, right? This is the case. Now, luckily they were protected, but I think there's some really big questions um, when it comes to new technology, it's not something because something gets a new fancy technological wrapper that it's good. I wonder if I stood on the street corner and handed out monopoly money, how, you know, that would go down. Uh, I'd probably get locked up for being crazy. 
And on, on the final point, I just wanted to, because we, we haven't talked so much about it, but I think it's uh, it's very important. So I, I, I mentioned already about the, 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 the future organization of the, 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 the general organization of the central bank's balance sheet and the, and the way the, sh the, the, the short-term money market operations work. And I think there really is a big debate on how much excess reserves are truly excess. You mentioned, Isabella, that many of the excess reserves today are held in the HQLA portfolios, and this is clearly desirable. Um, so I think we have to really ask questions. Are those excess reserves in the traditional sense? And uh, I, I, I love it whenever the ECB puts out the new chart with the HQLA breakdown. I wish we had it as a regular report, but that's another story. Uh, you know, maybe it's a request I can make in this building. And then finally, on the central bank digital currency, I think this is something we have to think very hard about. Uh, there was a very nice report from Angeloni, which came out uh, last week on this on this question. Um, but there is a very interesting question as well when it comes to sovereignty on central bank digital currencies. And the question is especially important for a number of emerging countries, uh, whether their monetary regimes could be threatened by large countries offering these type of services. So I think it opens a lot of questions, probably more than we have time to discuss here today. But I think it's uh, hugely important to, to think very carefully uh, about what this new technology could mean. Thank you, Michaela. Um, when you said about the, the different products um, and banking products sold at retail level, I've been uh, following, um, uh, not with so much detail, but about the efforts to create um, a green mortgage contract. And uh, there is a drive, maybe there is an occasion, um, a chance, an opportunity with uh, climate change and all the new regulation is going to come on that to create some European products with uh, green standards. But I, I see how long it's taking for this uh, green mortgage. Yes. Maybe just to respond to that, you know, I think we've had several times we've had hopes of creating European products. We had a hope in a pension area as well. We've had several hopes along these lines. But, you know, just on the green mortgages, keep in mind that the most important thing is to, again, help people finance the transition of their existing high emitting homes to make them low emitting. So it's really about the transition, unless we're tearing down the historical centers of our towns, which I think would be a shame, you know. Uh, I think we have a, a huge transition challenge. So again, if we're creating a green mortgage, great. But if the green mortgage is not allowing people to do the transition, it scares me. Because then it becomes something for, for the wealthy people and is going to create fragmentation because low-income households will never be able to then access such a product. And, and that's a concern to me. Uh, Elizabeth, um, the floor is yours for the second round comments. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Um, I, I want to add my voice to those of my fellow panelists um, ple pleading for more Europe. And there are a number of reasons to do that. Um, uh, I think we've benefited enormously from great thinkers, that policymakers that have uh, develop the Europe that we now enjoy that is operating in a safe and sound manner in the financial area. But there is so much more that needs to be done. And I also, um, Stein, when you said, please, let's not have a liquidity crisis be the reason why we finally agree to complete the banking union, I, I could not um, support your comments more. Um, we need to have a, a capital markets union that allows for uh, risk transfer to take place in a more appropriate way. We have very heavy balance sheets in the European institutions compared to the US balance sheets, for example. And if we had an operating securitization market, um, we would have a stronger risk transmission mechanism that would um, put our institutions on even sounder footing. Um, we need a deposit insurance scheme 
the ring fencing that we see is a result of a lack of trust across borders because of the potential for a taxpayer bailout. And uh, that is a direct implication from not having a completed um, deposit insurance scheme for all Europeans. And that is hindering cross-border consolidation. Um, we, I, I, I agree with Mikhail when she says everyone thinks we need these things and everyone also thinks we're not going to get them. Um, we should really bear down on both of these concepts and try to see what could be done. Um, the work that's taking place in Brussels now on the trilogues on uh, the CR3 and the CRD6 package, um, I think we've benefited tremendously from being very faithful to the Basel standards. Uh, I, and we see what happens when uh, the, in the current environment, it's a, it's a reminder that loosening Basel standards weakens the resilience of the banking sector. So I very much encourage that um, we continue to approach uh, those, those components with faithfulness and timeliness to the Basel standards. Um, I'd like to also mention um, the CDS market. We haven't really talked about that. In the recent days, um, we've also seen uh, in the last month how relatively small trades can lead to very sizable moves in single name CDS spreads. And there's low liquidity in that market. There's very high opacity. And there's a lot of uh, media coverage. And uh, we've now learned quite a bit what that media coverage and uh, social media can, can do. It can be highly destabilizing to the wider securities markets in general. So anything we can be doing from a policy standpoint to enhance the transparency in that market um, and its participants on a global level, I think will um, can be very important for uh, continuing to have uh, resiliency in our, in our banking system. And then um, crypto. Uh, I think it's important just to quickly mention crypto. You know, I've been studying this area a little bit recently and become, you know, quite concerned about what I see as a, an overall gap in the framework that's there and how we can achieve consolidated oversight of the firms. You know, we're talking about um, wanting to have more cross-border consolidation in the European market. Well, in the crypto area, there's no such thing as borders. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, companies that essentially can escape supervision because they don't have a primary supervisor. The concept in banking regulation about home host supervision, um, you know, where there is a reliance on the home country supervisor, how can that be applied when you have companies, crypto companies operating that have no headquarters in a jurisdiction or say that, 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 that that's the case. And in the securities world where you rely on equivalency regimes, you have the same problem there as well. So we have legislation in Europe, again, a first in the world uh, with Nika coming forward. But I think that, um, you know, for supervisability of these crypto institutions, uh, we really need to be looking for a framework globally for a consolidated approach, approach to oversight. I think there's a pretty big gap there. And I'll close there. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth reminded us of all the needs uh, still to be done for more Europe. And uh, in our panel uh, up to now, we haven't mentioned, I think, yet safe assets. But I think it will be a good way to start and to kick off having a more union in Europe. So now I open the floor to questions uh, from the audience. Please. Um, identify yourselves and uh, I only ask you to refrain from um, asking about first quarter results on Societe Generale because you're not going to have an answer. I say this to journalists who are here with us. <laughs> Also online, and but uh, you will tell me if uh, there are questions online. So I will start here. Yes, uh, on uh, the first row, and then uh, Victor. Yes, thank you, Klaus Dimmen from from the ECB. Um, I was wondering if, when we are thinking about mergers as a way to change the banking system, 
uh, we really get the full full scope. And I wonder more what your thoughts are on the change in the business models of the banks going forward. I think Michaela mentioned a couple of examples very much related to technology, but even if I abstract from methodology, you could think about something like someone who really focusing on one business line, contrary to the more universal banks that we have at the moment, and then reap benefits from their scale up, maybe a bank that focusing only on auto loans with ABS doing a new way to, to, to get the funding. Uh, very much monolithic, um, could be also other ways how to completely new business models could shape up and, and really change the banking sector. So what, what are your thoughts about this? Or is this, um, is this less something that you foresee possible in the future? Thank you. Um, who would like to answer? You can have all the go. I think everyone's looking at me on the on the table here. <laughs> So, you know, I think it's um, I, I think it's always very hard to to sit down and project. This is what the banking system looks like in twenty years' time, because I think it depends so much on on so many things uh, of what's happening around us. But I think I think banks play a, a unique role in society, and uh, on a regular basis, you know, we have these debates. Maybe we could just get rid of the banks. Um, but every time we, we, we have a serious conversation around it, we come back to the fact that we, we need the banks to provide uh, certain services to our societies, both in terms of offering uh, a, a safe place for people to put their money, and also in terms of offering financing to the economy. We've talked about the SMEs. SMEs, uh, you know, we can talk about capital markets, we can talk about crypto platforms and things like that. I, I think they're always going to be financed or by something that looks like a bank because it's the type of proximity relationship. And I think there are some unique things about banking, which means that I think banking is going to be here. Then we can discuss about, you know, how big should the banks be? Should they be universal? Should they be monoproduct? Uh, and we can, we can have discussions around this. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for diversity. I'm always a little bit worried about mono lenders, you know, because it brings back some bad memories. Uh, so that one sort of makes me go, oof, you know, when you mentioned it, I thought, oof, that was, that was not nice. Um, but so I think there's something to be said as well in diversity of, of banks' own business models. But I do think that, that we are seeing tremendous changes. Uh, but, but this has been the case always, right? You know, you go back in time, everything has been changing. When I was young, it was unimaginable that Sunday night I could go and transfer money between my own accounts. Now you can do that. So, so I think, you know, the technology changes a lot. But this is where I really put caution on, on not confusing the technology and the service. Um, because sometimes there's a new technology and then we... Under the guise of new technology, we just allow you know the wild west to emerge, and uh, and and I think that's quite dangerous. And I think the the reason I mentioned this is because what I do think is true is we're seeing these accelerated technologies, you know. So so I think there is a, a a lot to be to be asked about in 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 that respect, and that that is putting pressure on the banks, but it's also giving the banks a lot of opportunity. And maybe just to give you a, a thought, you know, if you look at the, the banking systems in Europe today, country by country, you can see that those countries that initially were highly digitalized, for example, the Nordics, their banks were very quick to close down retail networks because they could, because their clients allowed them to do so. Those countries that had lower digitalization, well, it's the opposite story. And I think this is something really important because at the end of the day, the banks are, are always adapting to their clients' needs. And, and, and if the clients are ready to digitalize and, and do all these things, if they're ready to do the climate transition, the banks will do it. Uh, so I think this, this, I think, is something we should always uh, have, have in mind. Anyone else wants to answer? No. So um, we have a second question. Did I see you correctly? Yeah.
Thank you. A uh, few questions to Mikala. Um, I was surprised when you referred that uh, for reasons of European sovereignty, we would need for finance more or less the same approach as the carbon border tax. Uh, I don't know exactly what you meant, uh, but if I uh, would be in a bank or thinking about the future of banking, I would be uh, perhaps more concerned with the, the uh, growth and competition of the non-bank financial system, which, as Stein said, has been much less regulated uh, and uh, insufficiently regulated, in my view. And you had no, uh, say, concern. You didn't express any concern with that, uh, especially regarding some elements of regulation that keep to favor the uh, non-bank uh, uh, financial intermediaries. I give uh, one or two examples. For instance, PSD2, which uh, imposes on banks to open what is a crucial element of their franchise, which is the information about their clients. Uh, so the banks have that every, every regulation uh, and all of that, but now in the name of uh, you know technological progress or whatever, they uh, should open mandatorily uh, that information if the, if the clients agree, of course, and then those uh, nimble fintechs in any apartment floor can, uh, can offer uh, advisory management of the money of uh, the clients of the banks. And as it didn't uh, add a big result, now the Commission just announced PSD3 in order to make it more efficient, that, uh, you know, opening of the uh, bank uh, franchise. That's an example. Another example in Mika doesn't define correctly stable coins, which, as you said, are deposits. And that's why the U.S. regulators, all of them, recommended that issuers of stable coins should be regulated as banks. Well, in Europe, that is totally out of the radar of the legislatures uh, of uh, MICA. Uh, regarding also, say, investment funds, to give uh, an impressive number, total assets of investment funds and mutual funds in 2007 were 17% of total bank assets. Today, they are 46% of uh, uh, bank assets. It's an explosion. Is this supposed to continue? Uh, and uh, do you think, as I do, by the way, that the regulation on uh, asset managers and investment funds should be more uh, uh, stricter, particularly, I think, in terms of mandatory liquidity uh, thresholds, uh, because they didn't follow the recommendations of the FSB about that, or that they should have also leverage ratios, uh, including on synthetic leverage? Why not? Why do banks have a leverage ratio uh, as I agree very much, uh, and not uh, uh, investment funds. Is this, then, the, then two questions around this uh, to, to finalize. Um, do you think that it is possible to envisage that the financials, our financial systems in the very long term will go fully in the direction of depending on capital markets alone, uh, where banks would not be necessary, or perhaps only for SMEs or something like that, or if the banks, by digitalizing much more, by using uh, AI uh, and then reducing stuff by the thousands, that they can survive uh, doing what uh, they do more or less at the same level and would stop the continuous shrinking of their role in our economies. Who would like to answer? So let, let me let me pick up on yes. a few of them. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll I'll pick up quickly on them, and then maybe others will will want to add something on it. But uh, so um, just a few things. So just on on uh, the green finance, my point is only it was no. There's no point in making the European banks green 
if you allow brown fi brown financing to come in from the rest of the world and and finance uh, so it was this was my parallel with uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism so this this was a the point there um so on the non-bank system um i have in my notes and if i skipped it i apologize but my my point is to say if we're going to provide some kind of protection you know some kind of bailout to the non-banks then they have to be regulated if people just get to lose all their money when things go wrong then fine as well but what we cannot have is a situation where we have an a situ so let's just you know let me just say not all the non-banks are completely unregulated there is regulation and we can discuss uh, you know the the extent of it but if you if you you need to have if you're going to have some kind of bailout you need to have the regulation uh, or some kind of protection because it doesn't have to be bailout but some kind of protection you need the regulation and then if it's something that's not regulated you have to be super careful about how it links into the parts that are regulated and and I think the problem is today the interlinkages between the banks and the non banks are significant and the reality is that we would in a crisis undoubtedly bail out big chunks of the system and for that reason I think there's a, a very strong motivation to to make sure we have a level playing field again it's like with the technologies if you are providing a service that needs to be protected it needs to be regulated be it from a bank or from a non-bank or from a, a technology platform whatever level playing field I think this is very important and then I think your your point on um, I don't think it's fair to ask any company to provide free services so if you're forcing companies to provide free services then it's no longer a private company right uh, then it becomes something different so so I think this idea of providing free services is is a big question you know it's a question that's raised uh, on data question that's raised if we do a central bank digital currency how does it get distributed how does it get compensated for is it enough um, so I think there's a, a lot of questions uh, here and again is it a level playing field does everyone have to share the data that they collect on their clients in that case fine you know maybe that's the way we're supposed to do it but if it's just the banks then you have to ask why so so I think that there are some big questions on this and I think uh, you know just on a general note I think very often we see and you know I'll share a personal experience with you um, with the MIFID regulation on research I remember having a discussion with someone I was working in investment banking at the time and someone said to me you know this is if your research was any good people would pay for it as a little bit you know you get a little bit upset when you hear something like this because you know you always think people want to pay for your research until you realize it doesn't work that way so how does it work let me ask you this if you have kids and you buy them a Netflix subscription and they come to you and they tell you there's a fantastic movie on iTunes do you say to your children of course I'm going to pay for the movie on iTunes or do you say I got you Netflix watch it and that's how it worked after Mifid so what was the result you killed off many of the small research houses and worse still, you killed off a lot of the research on small companies. Now, the banks actually warned about this. They said this is what would happen. But there was a, there was a, a, a no offense, Tolstin, but there was an academic thinking about how things work in the optimal world. <coughs> but the real world doesn't work this way. And I think this is why, you know, uh, it's, I think it's super important that we have dialogue amongst ourselves. Now, I am happy to say that there are some efforts to improve MIFID now. So that's good but I think it's really important that we have this dialogue so that we understand how things work you know the the academics have a fantastic contribution to make and uh, I'm a big believer in this but I think we really need to always have the policy maker the practitioner and the academics together to think about these uh, these types of solutions
that maybe it wasn't fair to ask Michaela on how to regulate non-banks, BC being in the bank, of course. But uh, uh, I agree very much with what she said. But I do want to have this caveat on when people say level playing field. Sometimes people say that means we're going to regulate the non-banks the same as the banks. That That's not the answer because we need non-banks to be different for a lot of reasons. Uh, and in some sense, we need more non-banks in Europe in the sense of equity financing that will give us the growth, et cetera, that we need. So we don't throw out the baby with the, the bathwater, so to speak, when we do in this level playing field across the board because then we may kill the sector. Just two quick remarks. Number one, I wouldn't like to live in a world which is ruled by academics. Really? Number one. Um, <laughs> number two, I think, uh, and, and you kind of, when, when you said, well, if it's regulated, it, if it's bailout, it has to be regulated. If it's regulated, it has to be kind of protected. Um, I, I got a bit nervous, but then you actually kind of also explained a little bit more because, unfortunately, in the real world, we have the sequencing, right? We first bail them out, and then we start regulating them. And I think that's the, exactly their point. And that's a, kind of this cat mouse uh, game between regulator and uh, well, in this case, unregulated uh, activities or risk activities that kind of um, you start regulating a certain part of the financial system and then they, the risk is being shifted somewhere else. And again, if it's isolated, that's one thing. But if it's connected, then it's the problem, right? And I think that's, for example, in the with, with respect to crypto, I mean, that's a big fear that many of us had, I guess, over the last couple of months. There would be a strong linkage, and it turns out there wasn't actually a strong linkage, at least for the moment. We don't know. I mean future looks different. But so I think that's something to be uh, watched carefully. Yes, thanks. If I could add just briefly um, on, on the growth in the non-bank sector and just to bring a supervisory view to that, um, it's been exponential. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the statistics on the investment fund growth that you cited, 17% to 46% of bank assets. That's an impressive statistic. But we know that there's also a tremendous growth in the lending activity. And um, here, you know, just to express a concern, my concern is about a lack of line of sight that we have to the provision of credit that's taking place outside of the banking system, which is not regulated and uh, what effect that can have on overall financial stability. So I, I, I'm an advocate for gaining far more visibility into uh, the lending activities um, and interconnectedness of, of financial interconnectedness of the non-bank sector from an overall systemic point of view. Do we have questions from the online? Yes? Yes, we have uh, for the moment one question to Elizabeth from Ulf Leverick. Um, you mentioned that supervisors need a more robust understanding of the risks and that the culture of supervision may need to adjust. Could you please elaborate on this point? Would this imply moving away, at least to some extent, from common regulatory metrics and putting more emphasis on pillar two requirements that are tailored to the risk profile of the bank? And if so, would this also imply that we need more disclosure on these requirements to help enforce market discipline? Thank you. Um, both the, the report that we received from the expert group that looked at um, the, the supervision in the SSM and the report um, that was filed uh, by, the, by the Federal Reserve uh, in its review of the supervisory failures focused in to some degree on supervisory culture. Um, in the context of the US uh, system where there was a, quite a bit of emphasis in that report, uh, the, the concerns that were expressed were about the impact on inspection teams, on examiners, of lowering the bar on a certain segment of the regulatory bar on a certain segment of the um, portfolio that they supervised, that this itself had a dampening effect on uh, the supervisory activities of, of rank and file supervisors. And then there was also um, a, a focus in on process in the US report um, related to you know, making uh, supervisors go through a rather lengthy process in order to escalate issues. Um, in the expert report for the ECB, 
it was a slightly different um, focus on the culture, um, but some similarities, certainly on the escalation point um, and enabling and empowering supervisors to act with more agility in the context of um, deficiencies that supervised institutions have. This cultural shift is what the report was quite focused on and supporting agility um, rather than very long drawn out processes that were built. The, the ECB, we're, we're only 10 years old in, in SSM supervision, uh, coming up on our 10th birthday. Um, amazing things have been accomplished in the SSM in that very short period of time, bringing us into the pandemic and into this more global banking crisis um, with a lot of strength. So, so much to be proud of. How that got built with so many different national uh, philosophies about supervision and processes for supervision was to make a very process oriented um, supervisory mechanism. And that, uh, and the advice in the report that we're receiving is to free up to some degree uh, from some of that process in order to be able to detect risk and to escalate remediation efforts. Um, the question that you have about uh, putting more emphasis on pillar two requirements. In fact, uh, in, in the expert report, the focus was on um, actually uh, spending more time on the non-capital aspects of supervision, which can be just as important, for example, in the governance area and in the business model area, and to uh, recognize that those don't so easily deficiencies don't so easily translate into a pillar two requirement in those areas. And to make the first port of call with respect to governance and business model as examples, to impose requirements on banks for correcting deficiencies and for putting remediation plans in place and to hold them accountable for achieving that remediation and that that will strengthen the bank far more effectively than by putting a capital add on in place in the first instance. The report went on to say that um, a capital add-on and pillar two requirements for those areas may indeed be perfectly appropriate if um, the remediation efforts are not are not being effective. So it was a, a nuanced point on this culture, but uh, you know the bottom line is it, it's it's about empowering the supervisors to make sure effective remediation takes place and effective identification of risk takes place. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, if we don't have more questions, I think also our time is over. And um, I would like to close with a, um, a point of view from a, a journalist and uh, the banks and the bank reputation of just a small anecdote. Um, I was uh, reporting on interest rises and there was also a very strong position, I wouldn't say from what banks, against interest rate rises. And I had the occasion to speak with them and said, but why are you complaining about interest rate rises? You make more money. Yes, they told me, but you know, it's not good for our reputation with our clients if they think that we're so happy to make money when they are having problems with mortgages, with loans. And um, I am Italian, as I told you. So in Italy, I was told that people go to a, a bank, local banker, like they go to see the priest in church for confession. <laughs> so there is a special relationship. And this is, I mean, with all the changes we've been talking about, uh, banks are uh, uh, really uh, uh, very, very special, uh, very special uh, players in in our society. So, all this is happening, and uh, banks will become more modern, more digital. But I think this uh, relationship, I hope, will not be lost because it's also important. I mean, if it's not a Catholic <laughs> church, but so uh, join me, please, with a round of applause to our panelists, because this has been a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth, also for being with us from one of the epicenters, I think, of, <laughs> of crisis. <laughs> and, um, Thank you. Thank you for being uh, and uh, so enjoy your coffee time. <laughs> <laughs>